Father Caesar's holes and stuff. Uh, when she posts a stone, I always take a minute to look at it because I have not seen her post anything that I would call swag. I mean, it's, it's, she has good taste and really good topic. stuff. Oh, we're going to see some swag. <laughs> all right. So, Lisa Elser, it's all you. Hi. Um, thanks for turning up in the middle of the show. So this is a talk that I usually give to appraisers, gemologists, valuers. Um, it's not a talk I normally give to faceters. So I'm going to give the talk, but I want to keep it a little more interactive. And I'm going to say some things that go against a lot of what I learned when I was coming into the business. Um, you know, I remember uh, a certain putz down in Oregon going, well, if, if you're going to do this for a living, you have to calculate the amount of the rough and multiply it by a factor of 8.4 and calculate your hours and add in your cost of rent, and that's how much the stone will cost. And when I started, I was running a $20 million a year software consulting business for Sun Microsystems. And you know the, the, that, that joke ad where the lady's trying to do Facebook on her wall? It's like, that's not how any of this works. Like, I run a business. That's not how any of this works. So I'm going to talk about how you really do value gems, what you can do to make them move faster, to make your gems more inherently valued, if not valuable. And the, the how you run a business at this is a completely different talk, and that's very individual. But I'm also, I do make a full-time living at this, and I have for a long time. So I will be willing to answer questions about that. Um, but I'm going to talk about how you actually value colored gemstones, which is what I do. I don't do a ton of concave. I do hardly any fantasy. I do a lot of precision cutting, and I, I try to make that all I do. Um, it should move light and enhance color. So it's not good enough to say, well, I cut it to the critical angle, there's a ton of light, but it's completely washed out. It should do both of those things. Um, it should absolutely either be meat point or be intentional. It's fine to not be meat point, but if some of your points meet and some don't, that does not look intentional. So the, the cutting should be good, the polish should be a very high quality. Those are the three things that I want if I'm gonna call it precision. So that's um, a spinel I bought a million years ago from Jason Grimm. Uh, it fails all of those categories. That's what happened after I recut it. I improved the color, I improved the meat points, I lost some weight, but I wound up with a much nicer gem. So if you're looking at same piece, different attitude, that's what precision cutting can do. And he looked at what you have to do in different materials with different pavilion sizes and how it works. And he's got a lot of really good stuff on GIA's website about cut performance for colored stones. So it's well worth going there and finding his stuff because he did, he did quite a lot of study. He's an excellent cutter himself. So it's Al Gilbertson and he is fantastic for a couple of pieces. I use it a lot, but you can see in the model how nice that is. The white is where there's some windowing, because there will always be some windowing. I mean, unless you've got an opaque stone, there's always going to be some windowing. But when you get moving like that, you can see the tiny bits of extinction and the tiny bits of windowing that actually add life to the gem. So if you're doing modern after <coughs> gems, and I do recommend it, um, look for those patterns. Look for a nice light pattern. You can see how great that is looking straight down, but very few people look at their gems straight down. You want something that looks really nice in all directions while someone's moving it. Uh, precision cutting doesn't have to have a unique design. You can cut classic designs. I cut ashers, I cut round brilliance, I cut all of that. But people want to buy an oval from an artist. That's an oval. It's a stubby oval. That's a pear. It's a shield, actually, but jewelers will call it a pear, and I will smile and nod. Um, mm -hmm. That's a modified rectangle. But they're unique cuts. They look different. They're, they're, they're sharper looking. Um, I just did a commercial job for somebody overseas who was looking for a line. They'd been getting rose quartz, 10 millimeter rounds, a little bit domey. So I asked if I could switch it up because they wanted to switch to me as their, their supplier. 
And I did one of Tom's custom designs that has a five-pointed star on the crown and a very small table. And they were blown away. But it still fits in their mold. They're still using it for their lines. Um, they cannot keep them in stock. So just switching it up with a custom design adds value. And it doesn't take me any longer to cut it than it does a round brilliant. It's a 10 millimeter round. It's, it's fine. I can do that. Um, there, is, there are now five lab reports that name the cutter. That cutter is in every report, Victor Tuzlov. Um, so I am not Victor. I like Victor a lot. I am not Victor. You can tell that because I am dramatically less attractive and I'm not nearly as nice. Uh, but you can also tell that because I can't cut like Victor cuts. Uh, nobody does. So we're really not in a place where the cutter is named in, in any significant way. Um, people will trace the mine. They'll tell you where it was cut, but they generally won't tell you. Does everybody know the gem guide? Okay, so Richard Drucker, uh, Gem World International, they actually survey the North American, um, I don't know that they look at Canada, they look at the US primarily, um, but they survey the market for gems wholesale. And they have charts that will say, all right, amethyst, sizes, qualities, wholesale price per carat. And that's what I use. And I use it for a number of reasons. I use it because it is actually market-based. Because it doesn't matter what the rough cost me. It doesn't matter how long it took me to cut it. None of that matters. It matters how pretty the stone is. Gems are objects. I'm not making pieces of art, unless you're, you know, Dalen or, or nobody is. We're making gems, and people buy them. And if my clients could go out and say, well, wait a minute, why is yours so much more? I needed to be able to point to the gem guide and go, you know what? Yes. This mint garnet is lower fine because I know what my grades are, I know what my colors are, it's this size, here's the wholesale per carat in the market. And if people feel like they can buy a piece from me in a unique design that's still market priced, they're going to do that. They are. Um, if I try to explain why my workshop is in Vancouver and it's really freaking expensive to live there and therefore they should pay me more, they're not going to do it. And this, for a lot of us, really goes against the, the old sort of folk wisdom of how you price your gems. People like the fact. Marketing takes it out of the realm of this is a thing. Because the gem is an object, and the object has a price. Once you start marketing it, you move outside of that. The object still has a price, but you want that connection of the buyer to the thing. I didn't know that woman in Brussels, but I wanted what she made. Um, I have a little network of collectors who want what I make. Now, I'm still pricing it at market but they want it from me. So this is the, the my, my tiny economics lesson. If I can sell one thing for $1,000 a month, or I can sell 10 things for $300 a month, which works out better for me? Um, even with the extra work of cutting 10 things, I still do better selling 10 things at $300 per month. So that's what marketing does. I'm not selling them for any more than I would, but I'm selling them, I'm selling more of them. I'm selling them faster. Uh, I, I am sometimes like, I mean, sometimes things sit there. I just did a little clearance of some stuff that I cut in like 2006 uh, and dropped a price on it because I wanted them out of my safe. But in general, I can post things and they sell within a day, day and a half. Um, some things sit there, but some stuff gets snapped up so fast I think my fingers are gone. Um, and that's the, the piece itself, the connection to the cutter, the connection to my buying in Tanzania or in Sri Lanka or in Madagascar. Those connections matter. 
and they make people feel really good about their gem because they know the story of the gem. And we, we're creating stories. When we but do. if you buy one of my larger pieces, you will get a certificate that shows you the rough, the cut, the design that tells you about it. It's not a lab report, although I am a gemologist, but I don't run a lab. But you get that story. Um, I travel less than I would like, but more than most people. And I do buy overseas. And I buy and I connect to the people I buy from and where I pick them up and how I found things. And that makes a real difference to people. Um, they, they sent a photographer and a makeup artist to the house, and that is more makeup than I have worn since puberty combined. But that was the picture they chose. So um, that, you know, that was an article in War Magazine in 2012. Uh, that was pretty cool, right? Like that, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. That's on my website. People say, oh, that, that connection to me. Who am I? What do I do? What do they feel they know about me? How do they feel they connect to me as a human being? Go back to people in gem-producing countries. Um, if they're selling I, diamonds, they're getting 5 to 10% margin on that diamond. And they're happy to get it. There's almost no margin on diamonds. The, the minimum uplift on a colored stone is 100%. If I sell it for 100 bucks, they're going to charge somewhere between 200 and 300. So when I go out and do gem events with, with jewelers, they cut me a check for wholesale after. And I price it whatever their markup is, which could be 2, 2.5, 3%. Um, so they're making money on this. They should want to sell it. It means an investment in understanding why colored gems are interesting. And this is where we can play a part in what you do and like how you use them and why they're interesting if you can connect the story and rough hunting here in tucson is still a story you don't have to run around the backwoods in madagascar although i highly recommend it um you can run around here and find stuff and tell the story of finding your pieces you can share little videos and clips i do that on instagram of cutting i um i i cut a tanzanite and heated it and posted the before and after on Instagram.